Good morning, church. Let's stand to our feet. Happy Easter. I wish I could tell you, wish I could describe it, but I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture, not enough words to simply say what I found. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful. Together worthy, who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. I'm not letting the rocks cry without joining the chorus. There aren't enough notes to make the harmony. It's the song of the angels, angels. through all of the ages, angels. with all of the earth and heaven symphony. Sing that. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful and powerful. Who are we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory. Give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. My shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defense. Together worthy, who we talking about? That's my king. Yeah, we declare the glory. We give him all the honor. All together worthy, who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. Who we talking about? That's my king. Who we talking about? That's my Can I get some audio? There it is. God is good. Amen. Happy Easter. Welcome to church to our guests and visitors. We are so uh, thankful that you're here. We pray that you're blessed by being a part of this service today. As the choir comes down, the kids are going to begin to come up. We have a uh, bell ringing that they're going to do. Nikki and Rebecca have been working with them and seeing them come up. I'm thinking about last Thursday. So we're going to move into our time of receiving our tithes and offerings. But last Thursday, on Monday, Thursday, we had our shoe project. And because of the faithfulness of this church family, because of your willingness to give, because of your willingness to serve, your willingness to pray, there were 161 pairs of shoes given to kids in this community. Amen. Listen, I've... I've been a part of a lot of things in ministry, 
I haven't been a part of anything better than that. You see some kids, and I'm not blaming parents because there's a lot of people that are struggling and trying to make it, but we take it for granted a lot of times. But to give them a new pair of shoes, one kid, the moment he got those shoes on, he was doing dance moves I didn't think were possible. And when you saw his shoe, it was completely gone. He had the light up shoes, and it was worn down to the point that he was standing on the battery pack. But guess what? He got to experience the love of God through a pair of shoes. That's worth celebrating this morning. And if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, Paul says that everything we do as Christians would be in vain. But because he has been raised, everything we do from preaching and worship to giving, it doesn't just have value in this life, but even the life to come. Amen? Two reasons that people struggle to believe in the resurrection. Number one, it's so remarkable, and I get that. But number two, if you believe in the resurrection, you have to change your life. And guess what? I'm not in control of this right here. He is. Number two is my wife. And then I'm way down on the list. But because he is the Lord, he's in control of even my finances. And because he's risen, we give this morning knowing that his kingdom will go forward. Amen? So our ushers are going to come forward at this time. Uh, take just a moment. Prepare your heart. Prepare your offering. And as the offering basket, as it passes you, I just encourage you, take this moment just to pray. And then as soon as that moment is done, these kids will begin their bell ringing. But let me pray for us real quick. Father, thank you. Thank you for your son. Not only for his death, but for his resurrection that our sins have been forgiven, that there is resurrection power, that lives can be totally transformed. We thank you for this opportunity to give and to see your kingdom go forward. God, bless those who are so faithfully giving this morning. Let your name continuously be glorified, not only in this church, but through this church. Did, Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He came out. We're not just going to stay in these walls. We're going to share his love with all of this community and across the world. In Jesus' name. Amen.
This is your chance, kids. If you don't like the ones that brought you, you got options. Please stand for the reading of the scripture. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. When the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said to these things to her, the word of God for the people of God. worship now it would be the time to go do this good morning church he is risen if our ushers won't want to tell some folks we have about we have there's some seats up here to the front I'm sure that You'd like to sit on the front row. I never did like sitting on the front row. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that death had no dominion over you. Neither does it to those who believe. And trust in you. Thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Easter, of course, a day that we cheerfully celebrate victory over death. Clearly, the dominant mood in this place, as in our churches all over the world, is that of joy. We have journeyed with Jesus through Lent, beginning with Ash Wednesday. And we have walked through the scriptures that lead up to this day. Yet we find ourselves maybe this morning a bit anxious. We may be a little bewildered when we read the gospel accounts that Natalie just read to us this morning of the resurrection. If this is where we are today, we're in good company, friends. The first reaction of men and women who came to the tomb wasn't joy. It was bewilderment. And fear, the immediate impact of the resurrection on the followers of Jesus Christ was confusion and apprehension. Mary Magdalene, she was in shock. And the disciples, regardless of John's comment as as, uh, the one that Jesus loved looking in and believing, 
they were clearly unnerved by all this. After all, they went from the tomb, and guess what they did? They went and locked themselves up. Sound like a bunch of folks shouting joy, hallelujah, praise God to you? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. So it adds up to this. Whatever else followers of Jesus might have foreseen, following the crucifixion, whatever they dreamed of, they did not anticipate a resurrection. Even though Jesus had told them at least three times that he was going to die and in three days be raised, they didn't expect it. That apparently was about the last thing that they expected, actually. So the discovery of an em empty tomb left them disconcerted, hesitant, and yes, scared. If we're going to understand the power that is embedded in the very heart of Easter, we need to come to terms with the disciples' strange reaction of this bewilderment and fear. That's hard to do because Easter comes as no surprise to us. We've been looking forward to this day. I don't know. We've had it on our calendars for, I don't know, since last year. We've been waiting all through Lent for this day. We expect it. We plan for it. You and I know when it's going to happen. Even how we're going to respond to it. I mean, serving a risen Savior means more than giving him lip service, doesn't it, friends? If the grave couldn't hold him, then we shouldn't expect it can hold the believer either. That's the good news today, if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian. So maybe the question is, where do we go from here? So what? Jesus is risen. What do we do with him? In the days to come, how will we follow? How will we respond to the call that he has on every life in this worship center this morning? What are we going to do with him? We know the day on e in which Easter is going to be celebrated next year. We, we can tell you. We're real good at that and planning everything out. And perhaps you know where you'll be. And we expect it. And, and sometimes maybe we tend to lose the sense and the amazement and the surprise. Where you see, sometimes we make Easter fit. We make sure we have all of our ducks in a row. But while Easter's revelation of resurrection is anticipated by us, it took the disciples by complete surprise. A person who had been dead for three days doesn't just get up and walk away. Mary's journey that morning is our journey. On many a, on many a morning, Mary Magdalene had not forgotten how Jesus had turned her life around. How that he had given her hope in a world that had no hope. She came to the tomb to finish the work that hadn't been done last Friday. She came to anoint the body of Jesus. Something awfully strange about it. When she got there, the stone was rolled away. Mary ran and told the two, two of the disciples, the one that Jesus loved and Simon Peter, that they had taken the body of Jesus. And she said, we don't know where they have taken it. Well, they began to run to the tomb. Of course, the younger outran Simon Peter, and when he got there, he peeked in. He didn't go in, but he peeked in. He saw the linen wrappings but there, but he, he didn't go in. When Simon Peter got there, he entered the tomb. The linen wrapping was um, uh, around Jesus' head was lying over by itself. And then the other disciple entered the tomb, and when he did, he believed. And then, guess what they did? They went home and turned on the ball game. <laughs> they went home. I doubt that they turned on any ball game. But they went home. They went home. 
Mary didn't leave. She stood weeping. And she looked back into the tomb and she saw two angels in white setting, one to put the other to head where Jesus had, had been. And they asked her, why are you weeping? Rhetorical question, isn't it? She repeated her words. They have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. She turned around and saw Jesus, but she didn't know it was Jesus. She didn't recognize him. Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? To whom are you looking for? She said, sir, if you have taken him away, let me know where you've laid him and I will go and get him. Jesus says, Mary, and she turned to him and said, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them the things that Jesus said to her. Whatever else is to be said, at this point, it is clear that the grave is not the end. If a person wanted to evade God, if we wanted to declare our independence from God, one of the first things that we would need to do is to eliminate the whole idea of resurrection. Indeed, our difficulties in believing the resurrection may be rooted in our desire to have the last words for ourselves. Y'all know how we are. You know how we are. For if death is the end, if there's nothing more, then through my dying, then I get to speak the last word. Not God. Then when I die, I will stay dead and that's it. And there are people who believe that. It effectively takes care of the problem of God in our lives. But it is motivated by the desire of the creature. Remember, creator, creature, creator, creature. Motivi motivated by the desire of the creature who insists that our bodies are our own to do with what we wish and that life's destiny lies not in God's hands, but in ours. Our basic instincts resist granting God power over our life and in our death. It seems that the Lord uses ordinary things to make divine, his divine will um, come to fruition. Uses anything at hand. Mangers, leper colonies, crosses, graves. We've gone through all of them, haven't we? During this, this time of, uh, in, in Lent. That makes one wonder, what's God up to? Many of you here today have, have learned and, and come to terms with grief. Many of us are going through that right now. You have come to accept the grim reality of death. We learn to carry on. We have to. But part of that great astonishment for those initial followers was the realization that God works through suffering and death. The terrible tragedy which took place at Calvary shows us that. I'm sure that those first disciples believed that there was an abundant life in the hereafter. Jesus, and why I say that, because Jesus had talked to them about the kingdom of God so many times. But they didn't consider the possibility that God's grace would be accomplished through things like suffering and death. It's one thing to deal with the harsh realities like death and the disillusionment, but to live with them, to accept them. But it is another thing to face reality that is often the way God chooses to work in this world. These are methods by which God's purposes are carried out. God did not save us. Talking about Christian people. Did not save us from suffering and death. God saves us through them. Not from them, but through them. This fallen, sinful world was brought back into the loving embrace of God through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, 
God's only begotten Son. We wonder, what does this mean? And then what we're called when we were baptized. The imprint of the cross was made on us as a sign that we would not only share in the power of Jesus' resurrection, but we would know the fellowship of his sufferings. The promise of God is that society's will will be cured and the world recreated so that it recovers its lost beauty, its lost meaning through the suffering of Christians in this world. You see, God's people are called to share in the sufferings of Christ. In its milder forms, it might mean that we're called to give up our status symbols. Heaven forbid. And others that maybe we think are more important, that we might take more seriously on a deeper level, might be required that we, that we take a stand that will result in the loss of friends and family. And there's another aspect to the bewilderment and fear of Jesus follows, which we must not overlook in our pursuit of the meaning of resurrection. Before those first men and women could experience the glory of Easter, they had to come to terms with the fact that Jesus' resurrection, that there would come judgment. For when they buried Jesus in the tomb, they buried some things with him. They buried their hopes, their dreams for a messianic kingdom. They buried all the love and care Jesus had poured out into the world, especially for the unlovely and the unlovable, a lot like us. And the life-worn, the bruised, the brokenhearted, all that went to the tomb. But that was not all. They also buried a lot of other things that I'm sure they'd like to forget like we would. They buried their self-centered quarrels over who is the greatest. Remember that? Jesus about to die and they were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. They buried their petty jealousies and the ugly, sordid scenes of denial and betrayal. All that had been interred with Jesus. Then as the news of Je Jesus' resurrection went from one person to another, and, and this emotion engulfs them, is what? Fear. They were afraid because now what they thought had died had come back to life again. It all comes back. They must meet face to face the one to whom they had betrayed, blasphemed, forsaken. Apparently there's no forgetting. No wonder the disciples were afraid. I get it. Instead of being able to forget, they would be forced to relive their shame, or so they thought. Perhaps that's why the gospel accounts often speak of the first word, not be of good cheer. It's not that, but rather, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For the one who brings everything back to life again is the one who loves us and gave himself for us. The one who permits no escape, no forgiving, not forgetting, even in death, is the one that remembers and loves us always. Of course, none of us deserve that love. We know that. The first followers did, and we don't either. That's not the point. The point is, God and the Easter exclamation that God loves us. Thank God there's no escape from that love. Paul was convinced of it, that nothing could separate us from the love of God. And that was Mary Magdalene's experience 
her encounter with Jesus, it made it clear when he spoke such love and, accept, and acceptance from his words that in joy she ran so that, to him so that she might be embraced by him. He had sought her out in love and compassion. He had come the, to the same way for the disciples. And he still comes to you and to me in that way, loving us, compassionate, As a shepherd. That should mean a great deal for us today. We don't have to run from God anymore. If you've been running from God, you don't have to. You don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to try to hide. You can't anyway. We don't, and maybe more than anything else, we don't have to pretend. We don't have to pretend to God, to others, or even to ourselves. Our Lord comes back to resurrect us so that we who are dead in our sins don't have to live in guilt anymore. We don't have to be afraid of God. Easter proclaims that all the doors that shut us in, fear, guilt, anxiety, insecurity, they are all overcome, and the doors are now opened. Christ offers to open those doors for you and to give you freedom. He opens that last door to us, too, that door of death, the last enemy that you and I will have to face. You, did, you didn't ask to be born, did you? Anybody? But you were born. You're here. You didn't choose that. You didn't decide and choose to wake up this morning, either your alarm clock, somebody called you, or, or three kids wanting to hide Easter eggs. One of those three things got you up at four o'clock this morning. Christ will call you. Christ will call you, and you will arise, and he will give you life. If that's what you want, if that's the desire of your heart, that's the way it will be. And that's good news today, isn't it, church? Jesus Christ is risen from the dead so that you and I might live in the assurance that all of the doors are open to us. You know, it is so terribly frustrating, especially, especially on this holiest of days, to try to convey this, this awesome truth. For I feel and believe more about this good news than I could ever say. Can't say it all. Its truth is overwhelming, far outrunning our capacity to express it or even to understand. So I encourage you to simply take and run with it. Or better yet, let the gospel possess you. I invite you to go out from this place asking God to live out your life with the kind of abandonment, joy, and righteousness which is fitting for one who has received so much and we have received so very, very much. God bless you. On this holy day, the day that we say to one another, he is risen. And respond, he is risen indeed. Our worship service this morning is going to look just a little bit different. Um, I'll come up later and give and give the benediction. Um, but we're going to sing for a bit. Isn't that right? Y'all ready for that? We're going to sing for a bit. And uh, I always said, Jonathan, they'd rather listen to you sing than me preach. So there, there you go.
Just get these guys excited, you know. <laughs> Awfully good to be in worship with you today. Just a couple of things before I give the benediction. Uh, sympathy, of course, Faye, to, to you and your family, Rob, uh, on, on the death of your mom, Mary Miller. Uh, you, you're in our prayers. All the everything in this bulletin is important, but nothing is more important than the prayer concerns. I ask you to take a bulletin with you and and to pray, pray over these folks. Um, and maybe even pick up the phone and call them. Uh, let them know that, that the church uh, hasn't forgotten about them. Um, the Welcome Center, right out here to the left, you want to know more about Renew Church, uh, you can get the information right there. Uh, invite you to stop by there. Also good being in church with all of you. Yes. Amen. Yes. I want to I thank the church. I want to thank the church and the staff. Uh, Jace, uh, everyone for uh, this week and the Holy Week services and, and for putting all of this together. Thank y'all so very, very much. Um, you're awesome people. Um, you're, you're kingdom people. Receive this benediction. You've been to church, now go be the church. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Give him all the honor, all together we're